defeat it. So where can I buy eternal life? It's an odd subject, isn't it? But in our psyche, God has put eternity in the human heart, as we read in Ecclesiastes. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. And other religious groups that are not Christian, most of them have some idea of wanting to live after they die in some form or another. So um, you might have heard the story about a little child in Sunday school who the teacher was telling that the Jesus was coming back to earth, but we don't know when. And this little girl said, well, why don't we Google it? So last night, out of a bit of fun, I decided to Google where do we get eternal, how can we buy eternal life? And this is what I found. The first facility in the southern hemisphere that's capable of storing frozen dead bodies so they can be brought back one day to life should open in Australia next year. This is not a joke, this is serious. Foundation members Ron Fielding and his son told the ABC News they are excited about the prospect of being awakened in the distant future. And he goes on, for $50,000 as a foundation member, you can help build the storage warehouse at Holbrook, north of Albury in regional New South Wales. It'll be called Southern Cryonics and it can store up to 40 bodies. Well, there you go. So people want to live on and uh, the Bible doesn't talk about that. So the question tonight is how much does it cost for eternal life? And we are very tuned in to materialistic thinking. Most of the things that we do in our daily life involve some sort of money. For example, how much will a week's holiday on Kangaroo Island cost? When Maureen says, let's go to Kangaroo Island, how much will it cost? Or if you want to buy a new car, do we buy a Toyota Corolla or a Nissan Pulsar, which is the better value? Or I need a new dress for my friend's wedding or a bigger house? And all of these things are about money. Am I getting good value? Would it be cheaper online? Should I wait for the end of financial year sales? How about after pay, where you can pay later? Or is Harvey Norman or Good Guys the best ones to go to? So we are very tuned in to materialistic thinking. I want something from you and I'll pay you money. You want something from me, you pay me money. It's just how we are brought up. We are drowning in it in our culture in Australia. However, there's a very lovely saying that the best things in life are free. And um, here's some examples. They're all from God, really. Watch them as I go. The love between two people. The love between members and a family. A dog's unconditional love for its master. A cat's acknowledgement of its owner. You know, if cats could text, they wouldn't. Watching a beautiful and amazing sunset and marvelling at the great artist of the universe. Seeing the daffodil flower in winter, we've got one. Watching the blossoms emerge in spring. The best things in life are free. Snorkelling amongst the coral and watching the abundance of brightly coloured fish darting everywhere on the Great Barrier Reef. Last of all, getting the first smile from a very small baby. They are all things which are free. I mean, getting to the Barrier Reef's not free, but once you're there, it doesn't take much. Um, and people who are in great poverty, think about this, and have got no money, can enjoy these things which God has provided. It's quite a beautiful thought. So they all come from our Heavenly Father who has done all things well. So we happen to live in what you might call a two-speed economy, a two-speed world. The materialistic world which we're swamped with on the TV. Can I afford it? Is it good value? I expect to pay. I don't even want charity. No, you can't help me. I must pay. And the other side is a world where the best things are free. 
courtesy of our amazing Heavenly Father. Does anyone make a comment about any of that so far? Can you get the relevance between being materialistic on one hand and being enjoying things that God's provided free? Okay, so where can I buy eternal life and what does it cost? What does the Bible say and what did Jesus teach? Now in Mark chapter 10, um, we might look at this if we could please. Mark chapter 10. I think I've got the wrong, oh no, sorry. Uh, the rich young man in Mark chapter 10 at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. There's a second example. This one I think was genuine. I think he was a, a man who wanted to ask, he wanted to know. People want to have eternal life. The second one is in Luke chapter 10 if you could turn to that as well. Um, at verse 25. And in this one, it's a little different. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanting to justify himself, so he asked, and who is my neighbour? And we know that parable of the Good Samaritan. Who is my neighbour? And there again... Um, in that parable or that story, the person had to give his time, his care and his money. He paid for the accommodation. So in all these things, there's things that people need to do. So how much does it cost? Eternal life is free, absolutely free, but eternal life costs everything. So how is it free? Isaiah 55 is a really good example. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and you who have no money, come buy and eat. You'd think it might say and it'll cost you five dollars. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Without money and without cost. So it's free, come to the waters, all you who are thirsty. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. So there's one example of eternal life effectively being free. And here's another one. John chapter 3 at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Very famous quote, probably the most well-known scriptural quote in the whole world. And um, so there's 
two examples come by without money and without price and God gave his one and only son. So you can see that salvation, eternal life, is basically free. And yet we have to spend our whole life. It costs everything. Peter says how we are redeemed. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold, once again, no need for money, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. In Matthew we read about the man who the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again and in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So some help here from some of the audience. If it's for free, does that suggest we have to buy it? He bought the field. He went away and bought the pearls. What's your thoughts? Thank you. We buy not with money, but with commitment. I think that's spot on. Thank you very much. Now in Revelation, at chapter 1, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. He has freed us and has made us to be a kingdom and priests, to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. And in Revelation chapter 5, they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. I don't know whether I have any quotes tonight on being bought, but there are some quotes in the New Testament. You are not your own. You have been bought. Um, perhaps Jenny might look one up for me. Or oh, Neville. Um, just let me catch up here. First Corinthians six verse twenty. What does it say, Nev? Yeah. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Is that right? And in your spirit which are God's. And in your spirit which are God's. Right. So I hope you'll excuse me if we're quite short tonight. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to have any more discussion about the fact that we don't have to pay money for eternal life. We give our lives and we give our lives in willing service, not because we have to earn our salvation we've already been saved we give our service 
in thankfulness for what God has done for us. And it's very similar to all those beautiful uh, examples of the beauty of creation, the best things in life are free. Our salvation is free. God offers us salvation. He wants us to be in his kingdom. And my last slide, God's grace is lavished on us. In Ephesians, to the praise of his glorious grace, which God has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Any questions, any extra comments? We've got time if you'd like to say something. But I think no one else? Yes, accordance with the riches of God's grace which he lavished on us. Don't ever think that God doesn't want us in his kingdom. He's given us free will, as we all know. We're free to serve him. We're free to <coughs> disbelieve him if we want. But he wants us in his kingdom and he's been so generous. Thank you very much.